After failing to qualify for the 1984 Olympic boxing games, 18-year-old Michael Gerald Tyson made his professional debut in a first-round stoppage over Hector Mercedes. No one outside of mastermind Custy Amato could have predicted the impact and legacy this kid was to carry out. Of course, this was no ordinary kid. It was the soon-to-be-coined Kid Dynamite. Henceforth, Tyson's ascension will be accompanied by this distinct background music, hyping the long-awaited arrival of the next People's Champion. You're in for a treat with this kid. On the undercard of Perseverance, the grand finale. Former WBA champion Michael Dokes made another sporadic return to boxing and won over Tex Cobb via disqualification due to a clashing of the heads that cut him open. I should explain the sporadic branding for Dokes. Since being ruined by Kutsia in 1983, he fought once in 1984 and now twice in 1985. He would not fight again until 1987, continuing an unexpected win streak of momentum towards the Ring Magazine elected 1980s heavyweight fight of the decade but I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll get to that. And now the main event. Undefeated David Bay had his shot at the brass ring against Larry Holmes. While swinging for the win, Bay managed to stun the champ in the second. He would miss the window to finish Larry, seeing as Holmes always responded well to being hurt. From the fifth on, Holmes made it his fight as he followed the wisdom of Eddie Futch. In the eighth, Larry dropped Bay twice, and the bell prevented him from potentially ending matters then and there. In the ninth and tenth, the champion had his way until the stoppage. 47-0, 19 title defenses. Would Holmes follow his word that Bay would be the finale and retire? Well, everybody's got a price and Larry's was no less than $3 million, apparently. He gave promoters until June 9th to convince him. Fun fact, said date would mark the seventh anniversary of Larry's championship origin, the legendary war between he and Ken Norton in which Larry edged the decision. Larry wanted a lot of money for a minimal effort fight, something he felt he'd earned from paying his dues. Specifically, the $3 million mentioned earlier would cut the check for a lucrative fight with light heavyweight marvel, Michael Spinks. Hmm. In the prelude to Blockbuster in Buffalo, Tim Witherspoon captured the NABF title from James Broadax Broad in the second round. Witherspoon's vicious finishing of Broad was considerable. WBA champion Greg Page made his first defense against Tony TNT Tubbs. Tubbs utilized a conservative game plan and scored a unanimous decision to claim the title. If you followed their amateur history, you'd probably expect Page to have won as he took six of their seven bouts. Page himself said he'd win in four. The night before the fight, Page's title was stolen from his hotel room. Any notion that Page was the next Ali, a comparison unfairly thrust upon him, was squashed on this night. Still, the Louisville Rage was now a permanent member of heavyweight history and had already proven his resolve. Perhaps he could return to the mountaintop again? Hot Potato Well, he's back, and despite the claims that it couldn't be against one of those young gun hitters, here we are, only two months later at that. Originally, this was planned to be home Spinks, but negotiations fell through on April 22nd. Thus, Larry Holmes welcomed the challenge of unbeaten Carl, the truth, Williams. Larry took the fight on three weeks notice. 
would it be a detriment to the aging champion in the face of the ever-growing strength and youth challengers? Let's find out. The 10-year age gap between the two was evident, but Holmes was such a fine champion that he was able to compensate for the handicap. Larry and Carl exchanged in another of the 1980s best heavyweight title fights, with Williams putting on a solid showing in case to be crowned champion. Larry was wobbled a few times, but likewise wobbled Carl, particularly at the end of the ninth. Williams had a notable flurry in the 11th. Holmes backed up Williams in the 15th, but failed to capitalize due to fatigue. Larry took advantage of Carl's dwindling aggression in the championship rounds and closed any gaps. When the final bell rang, both men showed the wounds of war. Williams a cut above the left eye and Holmes a badly swollen left eye. Williams bowed to the four sides of the ring and crowd in celebration of his performance and belief that he'd won. Did he really beat the champion though? The crowd felt so, as when Holmes was announced the winner by unanimous decision, they booed their disagreement. Carl stated that he had at least earned a draw. Probably the most beat up Larry had been. Remember too that he trained three weeks for this fight was 10 years older than Williams, and it was his third fight in six months as a 35-year-old champion. 48 and 0. 20 title defenses. He also almost cleared his $3 million asking price by securing $2.3 million. He could have hung it all up here, but he was just one off from the coveted 49 and 0 held by Rocky Marciano and history was about to present a once in a lifetime opportunity for the living legend Larry Holmes Holmes Williams was Reno's first heavyweight title bout since the 4th of July 1910 when Jack Johnson knocked out Jim Jeffries a final note I was tempted to give this fight the significant treatment, given it's one of my favorite fights from the 80s and was yet another milestone for the Eastern Assassin, but decided it'd be best to save said spotlight for Larry's next big fight four months later. On the undercard, Tim Witherspoon retained the NABF title with a lopsided beatdown over James Bone Crusher Smith. It was a unanimous decision for Terrible Tim, who was well on his way to another title shot. Also, isn't it curious how Witherspoon held on to the NABF title even through gaining and losing the WBC title? I found that interesting. In the main event, Pinklin Thomas successfully defended the WBC strap against former WBA champion Mike Weaver by eighth round knockout. IBF and lineal champion Larry Holmes was impressed and rumors swirled on if the two would unify. Tony Tubbs was also looking to settle things with Thomas ASAP after tackling a Tim Witherspoon defense. It's important to note that Thomas was being touted as the successor to Holmes. It was believed he would bring stability to the division and Holmes himself said he'd be a great champion once Larry himself sped off into the sunset. Mike Weaver even praised Pinklin after the loss, stating how he could definitely beat Holmes and had a better jab than the Easton Assassin. Pinklin wanted an easy defense next after a vacation before any major fights. The desperation for a true champion was born from the fact that contenders were drying up. Pinklin appeared to be the final hope. The next day, Larry Holmes signed for number 49 against the undefeated Jinx Bringer, Michael Spinks. On March 18th of 1983, Michael Spinks won a 15 round unanimous decision over Dwight Muhammad Kawi to unify the lineal ring and WBC titles with his WBA strap, becoming the undisputed light heavyweight champion. Almost a year later, on February 25, 1984, Michael added the IBF title 
to his undisputed crown and defended it twice before vacating it to move up to heavyweight. That leads us to June 16, 1985, where Larry Holmes signed to face Michael Spinks. The historical significance of this bout would be on full display that September when both men looked to etch themselves in the history books permanently. Michael got to work on transforming his body from that of a light heavyweight to a full-blown heavyweight. to go down because it's a law with Mike Tyson history. A September to remember. There could be no more accurate billing. It was 30 years to the night since Rocky Marciano notched his 49th victory over Archie Moore on a perfect professional career. Said bout was also another chapter in the storied rivalry between heavyweight and light heavyweight champions. I've covered this history in timeline form, link below. Both Larry Holmes and Michael Spinks had the once in a lifetime chance at history. For Holmes to match the impossible 49 and 0 crown of the rock and perhaps finally escape the shadow of Muhammad Ali or Spinks to join Bob Fitzsimmons as the only men to capture the title at light heavy and heavyweight and to finally banish the curse of little brother losing to big brother with the heavyweight title on the line. Both Larry and Michael were also undefeated world champions. There was awkward tension of sorts developing between Holmes and the Marciano family in the lead up to the fight. Obviously, they had to be involved given the great champion had tragically died in a plane crash 16 years earlier. On fight night, it would reach its boiling point, but we'll get to that. Among this issue was another for the Eastern Assassin. He'd noticed in training that he felt sharp pain whenever punching with his right. It was initially diagnosed as a pinched nerve and treated as such, but when the pain persisted, Larry got a specialist opinion and found he had a slipped disc in his vertebrae. Said specialist insisted Larry would be toying with paralysis if he went ahead with the fight and threw his right hand. It was so serious, apparently, that Larry should have been in surgery right then and there. Holmes got further opinions, was told he would be fine, and went through anyway. Yet another chapter in the storied legacy of Larry Holmes fighting hurt. Regardless, it was clear that the specialist's words of warning were living rent-free in Larry's head and right arm. More on that when we get to the fight. Billy Kahn, Archie Moore, and Bob Foster, all great light heavyweights who were nearly turned to dust by the heavyweight champion. Could Michael Spinks really become the one to avenge his predecessors? Let's not forget Larry's words and requests for easier fights against smaller guys. Bigger guys like Witherspoon, Bone Crusher, and Williams had almost taken Larry's lunch money, but he received the benefit of the doubt as champion and reigned supreme. Michael Spinks, the light heavyweight champion of the world, was the perfect request on paper. Michael had to be aware of this. He was a six to one underdog and Archie Moore himself had his money on Larry, stating that it would be easy for the Eastern Assassin. No reigning light heavyweight champ 
had ever beaten the reigning world heavyweight champ. Was he doomed to be number 49 or a cherry pick gone horribly wrong for the Eastern Assassin? He went about transforming into a heavyweight by putting on 25 lean, healthy pounds of muscle. He accomplished the coveted task of gaining power while not sacrificing speed. According to his trainers, he was even faster. Now, would this all be enough to rock the seasoned heavyweight champion of the world anyway? Only the hour of truth would tell. Speaking of the hour, here we are. Reigning Lineal Ring Magazine IBF champion Larry Holmes dared reigning light heavyweight champion Michael Spinks to beat him in the race to history. What followed was perhaps the primest example of the Sphinx jinx. There were no knockdowns, not even by Michael's famous right-hand jinx, but he outlanded Larry 318 out of 697 to 248 out of 567. Michael outworked and bamboozled Larry Holmes over 15 rounds to steal a unanimous decision and the true heavyweight title. Larry appeared hesitant to pull the trigger, particularly with the right hand, and everyone took notice. It was the one advice from his corner throughout the fight, and he never followed through, giving off the notion that he was fighting scared. Even so, there is still a crowd today that believes Larry should have won. Truth be told, the bout was closer than my initial Sphinx chink description lets on, but Larry waiting for a knockout opportunity that never came only made the decision easier for the judges. Maybe Michael hadn't done enough to win, but had Larry done enough to retain? Perhaps championship advantage says yes. On the other hand, winner's fatigue says no. In the post fight, Larry Holmes made infamous history, coming off as bitter and not knowing how to take defeat. He targeted the present Marciano family, in particular Peter, the younger brother of The Rock. I couldn't hope to do it justice by saying it myself, so here's the infamous line that will forever haunt the Easton Assassin's legacy. The line that permanently trapped him in the shadows of both Ali and Marciano. Rocky couldn't carry my jock strap. Making matters worse was that Larry told everyone that if he'd hurt their feelings, so fucking what? After dealing the damage, Larry doubted back a bit and credited Marciano as a true all-time great, but it was too late. Yes, Larry was right to be upset with how many had prayed for his downfall more so than for Spinks' success. Equally, he may have taken it too far, regardless of how any of us feel about the fantasy comparison between he and The Rock. We'll never know who would have won, but we do know this. Sometimes, how something looks is more important than how it really is. It's a sad, unfair reality we face. Whatever Holmes truly meant by the Rocky Jockstrap line matters none to a public that already detested him. Peter Marciano responded in an interview after saying how he thought Larry should have won, but was obviously glad he didn't. He felt that Larry wouldn't have spoken of Rocky as he had if the two could have met one another. Peter also admitted to telling Michael Spinks that Rocky was pulling for him from the great beyond. Michael, alluding to his knowledge of his underdog status, said he'd need all the help he could get against Holmes. Rocky must have lived up to his part of the deal. Now champion, questions swirled over how and if Spinks would match up with Pinklin Thomas and Tony Tubbs. Judging by the decades unification track record, we'd probably never know. History tends to rhyme. Remember how Muhammad Ali got the benefit of the doubt in some of those late career title defenses? and ran out of luck against a Sphinx brother? Larry's path had turned out the same so far, and for his sake, hopefully it would end 
as Ali's did in the rematch with a Sphinx bro. Also with this win, did brothers Leon and Michael become the first pair of brothers to become heavyweight champions. That's right, before the Klitsch Bros, there were the Sphinx Bros. Ooh, before we wrap this up, while we're bringing up Michael's older brother, Leon, is it safe to say that the embarrassing beatdown that Larry baptized him with in 1981 had been avenged in full? I'd say absolutely yes. In fact, the chance to double down on this and all Michael had accomplished on the night would come in the next year. A new age had dawned on the heavyweight division. Getting back on track, Frank Bruno knocked out the giant Viking Anders Eklund in four rounds to win the European title. Maybe all hope wasn't lost for Britain in their title hopes, and maybe, just maybe, Big Frank was spot on when he cited Ali and Frazier after his setback at the hands of Bone Crusher Smith. Hmm, only time would tell. This will be a win to let everybody know that Donnie Long is back. All of you come get some, because Mike Tyson's out here. He's waiting for you. All come get some. A huge loss for the boxing world, and particularly still rising Mike Tyson, occurred on November 5th with Custi Amato passing away after fighting pneumonia. His impact on the sport dates back to his beginnings in 1935. He was known also for handling the career of former heavyweight champion Floyd Patterson, the youngest heavyweight champion ever. Huss was like a father figure to Mike Tyson, and many point to this as one of the collapsed pillars in the story of his eventual downfall. The first trumpet, if you will. Now, again, you may be asking, who's this Mike Tyson kid you keep referencing here, and what does he have to do with the great Custy Amato? Oh, you'll see. To tempt fate with a fourth entry and continue a perfect streak, such was the goal of Sly Stallone. There are varying feelings in regards to Rocky IV. Some deem it a montage movie of comic book level proportions, while others celebrate it as yet another successful raising of the bar in the story that is the Rocky franchise, which itself mirrors the career of Stallone. You either love or hate this one, no in between. The movie opens with the emergence of two boxing gloves, one American flag draped and the other Soviet Russian. The gloves clash and explode, transitioning into a recap of Rocky III's final war between Rocky and Clubber Lang. Rocky and Apollo's rubber match once again freezes on the punch exchange, and in the present, Rocky is arriving home. He has a black eye, so he must just be getting home from the Apollo match, right? Well, the movie takes place in 1985, and Rocky III was in 1981, maybe 1982. With that in mind, I presume Rocky and Apollo have been having occasional friendly bouts over the years as a sort of boys' night out. The timeline in Rocky is something else, and I'm gonna make a video on it down the line. The Balboa celebrate Paulie's birthday, gifting him a totally cool robot, and Rocky begins settling into retirement. Remember, it was said Rocky's match with Clubber was his final bell. Apollo, meanwhile, is struggling in retirement, and the final straw turns out to be the arrival of a Soviet fighter, Ivan Drago. He is hailed as a super athlete in the future of the sport. 
Apollo, inspired by both patriotism and his inner warrior, heads to Rockies and talks up getting back into the ring. Adrian protests, reminding both Rocky and Apollo they can't take much more and have nothing left to prove. The two friends watch back their second fight and Apollo becomes fired up in his persuasion of Rocky in training him. They can't let this bum show them up, Apollo insists. He also insists that he doesn't want to change because if he does, the warrior in him might as well be dead. Rocky, who at first realized they weren't the same men they were, is won over by Apollo's pride. An exhibition is set up between Apollo and Ivan Drago. The press conference turns from comical to heated as the Soviets insist Creed stands no real chance at his age. Drago's bloodlust bleeds through as he smashes down the Apollo board. After a great entrance and showcase from Apollo alongside James Brown, in a display of America, Drago follows through on his early orders to you will lose. Apollo is literally slaughtered by Drago in the exhibition and dies in the ring. Rocky could have thrown in the towel, further evident in the cries of the crowd, Apollo's wife and Duke but he honored his word to let Apollo fight. In one of the coldest post-fight interviews ever, fiction or not, Drago exclaims that he'll beat the real champion soon and if he dies, if he dies. Rocky and Drago lock eyes and it's inevitable that they'll clash next. At Apollo's funeral, Rocky delivers a fine eulogy and swears he'll never forget his best friend. He's devastated and clearly feels at fault. Rocky and Drago agree to fight on Christmas in Russia, with Rocky also vacating the heavyweight title as the fight is unsanctioned. In a late night altercation with Adrian insisting he change his thinking, Rocky realizes Apollo was right and that he must fight Drago because that's how he's made. That's a baby. The montage follows, one of the best montages ever in which Rocky flashes back to the previous three movies and his life overall while succumbing to the guilt of Apollo's death. As Rocky ships out to Russia after reassuring his son Robert, Adrian stays behind, refusing to condone this suicide. Rocky, Polly, and Duke arrive in Russia and get right to work on preparing for Drago. Duke ensures Rocky that his faith is entirely in him now that Apollo is gone. Placing a photo of Drago on his mirror so that he sees him every day, Rocky is more focused than ever in his quest to annihilate Ivan Drago. Another great montage ensues of Rocky training by natural means in the harsh Russian winter as Drago trains with state-of-the-art equipment and trainers. At its conclusion, Adrian arrives to stand by her man as she always has and Rocky kicks it into a new gear in the following training montage. Drago also steps up his game using steroids. Rocky climbs a mountain upping the ante from the Philly steps and LA beachfront. As Rocky screams Drago, the film jumps to fight night with a sold out hostile crowd acting as further impossible odds against Rocky. Pauly puts his faith in Rocky and begs Rocky to blast this guy's teeth out. That's right. The crowd boos Rocky out of the building as he approaches the ring. It then worships Drago as he approaches. Rocky's iron gaze breaks as Drago approaches, showing he is still afraid. During the Russian national anthem, Rocky and Drago trade gazes. Rocky's physique reveals he is in the best shape of his career, but Drago's reveals he is 100-fold the monster he was the night he beat Apollo into the grave. The stare down yields the famous, I must break you. Then Drago wheels his gloves over Rocky's. 
Drago obliterates Rocky in the first round, even using some wrestling moves. The second goes the same until Rocky strikes back and batters Drago, showing this won't be a blowout. Drago admits in his corner that Rocky isn't human, but more so like a piece of iron. It only ignites the fire in the Russian further to break Rocky. No pain, take his heart. Yet another legendary montage ensues of Rocky and Drago pummeling one another into brain damage from rounds 3 to 14. The crowd begins cheering Rocky, his determination and will winning them over. The Russian higher-ups grow impatient with Drago, but Drago rebels, insisting that he fights only for himself. Drago grows irate that he can't stop Rocky, but this descends into respect come the final round. Duke informs Rocky that he needs to knock Drago out to win. Drago shows respects in a ring, saying, Rocky bides his time before exploding with an onslaught and knocking the Russian out. World War III, as fought by two guys in a ring, was over. After delivering a speech that ends the Cold War and coming to understand that Everybody can change. he is heralded by the Russian people, Rocky wishes his son a Merry Christmas and Hearts on Fire plays us out to a photo montage recap of the film in black and white. It was the third highest grossing film of 1985 and it remains the highest grossing movie of the franchise. It pushes the bar even further as an impossible four franchise entry that's good. Whereas Rocky 3 opened the door to becoming a franchise, Rocky 4 stamped the series into immortality. It would turn out to be an impossible height to surpass. You know, I still remember the first time I saw this movie, a Friday night after a long day at school at my grams' house and belly full of round table pizza, or was it Safeway Wings and Wedges? I don't know, but the point is I went there every weekend. I was channel surfing, this was before streaming, so you watch what the TV guide gave you, and caught a glimpse that Rocky IV was coming up next. I was like, there's a fourth Rocky? The experience that followed was one of the best weekends of my childhood as I was glued to the TV. Even the commercials were heaven. Apollo's death really rocked me and I was terrified of Drago. I couldn't wait for Rocky to avenge Apollo, but I had no idea how he'd beat him. The final fight felt to me like an anime final battle to end an arc. When the movie ended, I didn't even bother flipping over the Cartoon Network, Nickelodeon, or Disney Channel because nothing they had could hope to top what I just saw. I went straight to bed. Just a fine reminder of a more simple time of life. I love you, Grams, and I'll see you in heaven. On November 11th of 2021, I had the pleasure of attending the one-night-only premiere of the director's cut of Rocky IV. It was great seeing new scenes to my favorite Rocky movie on the big screen. For the record, I enjoyed the new scenes, but they came at the cost of some others that I also like. I prefer the original cut of the film, but I admire what this version was going for in line with the first three. I'd love to see a cut that integrates the best of the theatrical and ultimate cut to produce a sort of final cut. If you'd like to see live footage from my experience of the one night release of Rocky IV's Ultimate Cut, head over to my Instagram at the Charles Jackson and watch the story group titled Rocky IV. Link will be in the description. Rocky IV remains king for the Charles Jackson. <laughs> nineteen eighty five is in the books here are your ring magazine top ten ranked heavyweights what a year 
Larry Holmes had finally been upseated at the hands of the light heavyweight champion at that. Pinklin Thomas was the expected next big thing, and Tony Tubbs was looking to garner the attention of the boxing public. The title was split all three ways, and unification still seemed nowhere in sight. Michael Spinks' historical robbery over Larry Holmes was Ring Magazine's upset of the year. By robbery, I mean Spinks making history as opposed to Larry doing so. Whether Michael or Larry should have won is entirely up to you. Round of the year is Tyson Long's opening punch-out simulation in which Long satisfactorily ate his words. Of course, Michael Spinks' historic landmark takes home fight of the year. What else need be said? He won one of the most historically significant bouts of all time against all the odds. Completely out of tradition, I'm awarding fighter of the year to Michael Spinks. His feat of victory over Larry Holmes isn't to be understated and would shape the legitimacy of any man that could beat him, if any man could beat the Jinx. On January 5th, Francesco Damiani made his debut with a third round stoppage win. On March 15th, Tony Tubbs won a decision over Bone Crusher Smith on the Holmes Bay undercard. On March 31st, Muhammad Ali was a referee at the inaugural WrestleMania presented by the WWF, now WWE. The impact the event had on the world of sports entertainment is a subject for another timeline dedicated to professional wrestling. On April 30th, Razor Ruddick suffered a setback when he was stopped in eight by David Jocko. He took the rest of the year off and returned the next February to embark on an impressive run. On May 9th, Jesse Ferguson won a majority decision over Buster Douglas in the semifinals of the 1985 ESPN Young Heavyweight Tournament, a tournament he would win on June 20th to secure a world ranking. On May 20th, Marvis Frazier won a decision over James Tillis. On August 31st, Carl Williams stopped Jesse Ferguson in 10 rounds. Good rebound for Carl after the controversial Holmes loss. On the other hand, it was a gut punch for Jesse, who was coming off the momentum of winning the 1985 ESPN Young Heavyweight Tournament. On September 7th, Harry Kutsia won a decision over James Tillis. Not a good year for Quick Tillis as he lost both fights on the year. The coming year would see a surprising turnaround for him. In October, Don King visited HBO Sports President Seth Abraham to propose your average WBC title match. Abraham was little interested, but was interested in seeing a tournament to unify the heavyweight crown. Having been inspired by the currently televised World Series, whether this was to remedy the declining interest in the division or not, is a formality, I suppose, but the wait was over at last. There would be an undisputed champion at last. The first since Leon Spinks toppled Muhammad Ali in 1978. On November 2nd, Oliver McCall made his debut with a first round stoppage win. Mike Tyson won all 15 of his fights on the year and was generating a buzz the heavyweight division hadn't seen in what felt like an eternity. Hopefully, he wasn't a mere spark, but a flame ready to spread into wildfire. The coming 1986 would prove and provide the answer. Funny enough, this same year where the East and Assassin finally fell was the birth of the man who would succeed him as the face of the 80s. Sports write the best stories, and not even Vince McMahon could do this one better.